Welcome to this week's episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Liz Cavell, Associate Counsel here at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Um, I'm joined by Andrew Seidel here and Patrick Elliott. And I know the top said leaving Westboro <laughs> Baptist Church. We were supposed to talk with Nate Phelps, uh, formerly uh, raised in Westboro Baptist Church, but um, we're having some technical difficulties, so we are going to reschedule that interview, but we're also having some breaking news here at FFRF. Um, we found out this morning that one of our lawsuits uh, was resolved in our favor. A judge ruled in our favor in um, federal district court in Kentucky. So we dragged Patrick upstairs <laughs> to uh, talk to us about this breaking news. Um, so we're on a legal topic today, but we will be talking with Nate Phelps at a later episode. So, and if, well, and if people have questions though, still, yes, of course, they should absolutely send them, just type them in the comments, or you can send an email to ask an atheist at FFRF.org. And we're happy to answer any questions you have, especially since we don't have anything prepared for this. We're going to totally wing it. Yeah. Um, except for the years and years of work in preparation <laughs> that went into our lawsuit, Hart versus Thomas, that we won today. So, Patrick, uh, we teamed up with the ACLU to sue in Kentucky. Why don't you tell us how that lawsuit started and what it was about? Sure. Uh, you know, we sometimes take free speech cases at FFRF because our normal bread and butter is establishment clause. But when somebody with a non-religious perspective is being censored by the government, um, that's a violation that we can also address. And so one of our members in Kentucky, Ben Hart, uh, applied to get a personalized license plate. People might also call them vanity, you know, vanity plates. Um, and he wanted uh, to say, I'm God on his plate. And he wanted to have the In God We Trust plate. Um, this is something that he had in uh, Ohio, as pictured here, for 12 years. So he had the plate without incident in Ohio. He then had moved uh, to Kentucky requested the plate and the state rejected it and actually sent him a letter saying that um, basically that under Kentucky law he was prohibited from having this type of message did on they, his license plate. Did they give a specific reason why it was prohibited? Well, this is very lawyerly, but they had a site to uh, both a, a Kentucky administrative regulation and a statute, um, which uh, in our opinion, we actually wrote back in response to this saying that those weren't applicable to the type of plate that he was requesting. And also, one of those regulations was to say that this, that his plate was didn't meet the test of uh, good taste and decency. And so we had to <laughs> point out to the state how that actual standard has been challenged in a number of other places because it's just so vague that basically any government official or bureaucrat could just say, oh, I don't like this, this doesn't meet good taste. Uh, but what Ben saw on the roads, in which many people in Kentucky probably see, uh, there's people with a lot of religious license plates. They say um, pe people had a somebody had a plate that said "Love God." People had pray that said "Pray for" and all these other religious messages on their plates, but they wouldn't tolerate his his message. Right. Um, and so we tried to resolve this as we typically do. The state um, rejected it, and we ultimately had to file suit. Um, which, as you mentioned, Liz, was with uh, jointly with the ACLU of Kentucky. And so we brought suit, I think this was filed in the end of 2016. Right. Um, and so the case had been proceeding um, since that time until today. This is the breaking news that we have is the judge ruled on, um, on our, our motion to try to basically say that the state was violating his free speech rights and specifically that it was um, viewpoint discriminatory to say that you can't say I'm God on your plate, but you can allow all these other religious messages. Right. Um, and so that's the argument we were making. The argument the state was making was that in fact, all personalized license plates are government speech. Uh, so basically everything you see on a vanity plate is government speech, which would be quite bizarre um, and we pointed that out in our brief by kind of showing some of the funny plates, the funny things the state would be saying, um, you know, saying things like vegan and also saying barbecue for you. The state's obviously not saying both of these things simultaneously. Well, and, and just from a sort of behind the scenes standpoint, this was really... A kind of a funny lawsuit in a way because your our offices are next door and then Liz is next door to me and I wasn't involved in the case as a litigator but you would come over and announce okay everybody what does this license plate translate to and right. you and were, you were just scanning through just and you and uh, some of our interns were scanning through pages and pages of these personalized license plates trying to figure out what they were saying they have over 40,000 plates on the road we didn't look at that many we looked at plates that were applied for from 2016 and beyond, right. but 
there are, are a lot of times where you don't know what somebody's putting on a plate because it's a message that's personal to them. It might right. be an anniversary date and somebody's initials. Um, sometimes the state would reject plates and we couldn't figure out why they were rejecting it. Right. Here, one of the bizarre things they were doing is their go-to resource was Urban Dictionary. So even on a plate... <laughs> Even on a plate that was benign, they would search the phrase in Urban Dictionary and then reject the plate because they said it was indecent for some reason. So there's a lot of interesting kind of Everything's things. Everything's indecent on Urban right. Dictionary. So this is, this is what's kind of behind the scenes. There was certainly a process that didn't really make any sense, that the government um, could just censor at will. And that's mm -hmm. what they were doing. They'd pick plates that they wanted to allow and disallow certain plates. Um, for a time, they also started to censor more religious plates, which is also not what we wanted. They started to re reject certain religious plates, but allow others. And we thought that was a problem. We thought, actually, people should be able to put what they want on their vanity plate. And the government shouldn't decide, is something too religious? Is it is it a sectarian plate, or is it just a generic religious reference? And so that kind of became a part of the case. But uh, what happened today is the judge ruled in our favor. And so the judge ruled that... Um, rejecting Ben's plate and allowing other messages was uh, a free speech violation. And so we pretty much is a, a total victory for him, and he'll be able to presumably get his I'm God plate, as everybody else has been able to get their the messages that they've wanted on their plates. So what does this mean without, I mean, we're all three lawyers here, so without getting too uh, nerdy and technical, what does this mean for these this Kentucky bureaucracy side going forward? Like, is there going to be some sort of scheme that's not vague, not arbitrary, not based on Urban Dictionary um, <laughs> going forward as a result of this ruling? I think be because of the court, rule the court ruling, they will, the, the state will be on notice as to how they have to apply basically even rules, presumably create further guidance for reviewing plates. Um, there's really no, um, the ruling itself doesn't change any statutory scheme or anything. So the rules that were in place that led to problems are still there. It's just the state now knows they can't reject one message like this and allow others. So potentially, I think the state of Kentucky should revamp their statutes right. to make very clear um, that vanity plates or personalized plates won't, won't have this type of problem. But uh, with a court order like this, it's very easy for them to know now this is impermissible. You, right. can't, you can't pick and choose certain religious messages or non-religious messages or even political messages because that was one issue that wasn't yeah. a part of our case, but something that was observed is that they were allowing certain political messages and rejecting others. So if somebody wanted a plate that said Trump, um, sometimes that would get rejected. And again, I don't know why, why that should be, that people should be able to pick a message right. that they want. It wasn't really a, a part of our case because Really, our case was dealing with non-religious messages that were getting censored. So, so right now, sort of under the statute and regulations, it it gave way too much power to essentially like low-level DMV employees who were just allowing their own biases to infect the decision-making process. Right. Well, they were censorship. set up. They were set up to fail because yeah. um, there's a difference between what we're talking about in vanity plates and uh, what people may be familiar with are like specialty plates. So if you want to get the University of Kentucky plate with that motif and images, um, those plates have specific rules that say you can't promote religion or a political, you can't be a political organization. And so those rules were being applied to every individual's plate. And so that's what was going on that was wrong. Right. And so there's, if, if they're still going to be applying those rules, there's potential for future problems. But I think this is signal, this, this decision is signaling strongly that these are that these plates are private speech, you know, an individual is making uh, the point, and not the state. And the judge agreed totally with what our brief said on that point, which is basically the state would be babbling and making no sense if it was saying forty thousand different <laughs> things at the same time. Right. Obviously, this is private speech, individual speech. Right. And I mean, that makes sense to just regular people driving around on the road. Like what we're talking about when you saw Ben Hart in that in that photo with his plate is the actual letter combination of letters and numbers that make up your tag number and you wanting to combine six or seven letters and numbers to say something totally personal, usually weirdly personal, um, <laughs> you know, that 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 you came up with and and those things when you see them driving on the road and you're pointing out people's personalized, you know, vanity plates, um, it's it's absurd to think that that somehow is anything other than the private speech of the person driving the car or owning the car. Um, so this ruling is sort of 
uh, common sense uh, yeah, that, interpretation. Well, that's, what you would, that's what you would think. That's what we had been arguing. The state of Kentucky had vigorously been arguing against that and saying that these are actually state messages. And so intuitively, it doesn't make any sense. Legally, it doesn't make any sense. But the state really wanted to defend its decision to pro prohibit him from you know, having this, this, this play. And so now um, there's also interesting dynamics in t Kentucky with the changeover in administration. So if, right. if a new administration starts next year, they may in fact change who's running the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet and what rules um, are going on there. So may maybe this, maybe there is hope um, in the sense of how um, this very nuanced <laughs> area of right. plates are being managed. <laughs> and, and some people may think, oh, it's not as big of a deal, but it's it's kind of a uh, an area where the government's telling you your your opinion's yeah. not not accepted. Um, right. And, and in fact, Governor Bevan had in, intervened in specific cases to allow religious plates and had overruled the department and, and in a number of instances to say, hey, this plate should go through. And obviously he wasn't going to do that for somebody wanting a non-religious message. So right. I, I think it, it does deal with sometimes issues that are important to people, which the topic of religion certainly is. Um, that's what was going on here, even though it's kind of in this fun area of what do people put on their plates, and usually they're they're funny things. But if you wanted to even like extend it out, I mean, it's essentially it's a blasphemy law is really right. what it was. I mean, they're saying you can't have a blasphemous license plate right. because it is indecent and essentially would offend religious sensibilities. And I mean, that strikes at the heart of our both First Amendment and religious free exercise rights. So right. a number of the cases we cited to happen to be like blasphemy cases because yeah. the reasoning is so sound in that. We don't want we don't want government officials to decide what's permissible for somebody to say on religion, right? I think right. everybody should should agree with that, regardless of if they're religious or not. And people, you know, it's important to sort of categorize like what is my private speech because that decides whether or not you know the whole umbrella of free speech protections apply to mm -hmm. the, that <laughs> speech, or if this is government speech, a whole another kind of umbrella of. Um, restrictions and, you know, constitutional protections are at play. And it's kind of like the state of Kentucky was saved from itself by this decision <laughs> because trying to imagine right. them comporting their government speech on 40,000 plates with their obligations, such mm -hmm. as the Establishment Clause, to not promote religious speech, um, you know, to not take sides on other issues that are really important, to not um, weigh in on... Uh, political matters. I mean, it just yeah. seems like there's no workable way um, to adopt the the spe the individual chosen messages of forty thousand you know Kentucky drivers. So it sounds like um, right. th that argument was untenable, even though yeah. they were willing to go down with it. There can't be government speech that says Jesus saves on somebody's license plate. Right. So, so what's right. the workable solution yeah. when that plate's right. out on the road driving around as the the official speech of the state of Kentucky. I have no idea. Um, but people don't want to be told that this is not your speech. This is the speech of the state of Kentucky. People painstakingly labor <laughs> over those crazy combinations of letters and numbers. Oftentimes they pay extra money just to, to make that statement on their plate. Um, it's the kind of thing that people obviously view as their own free speech. Um, so I think it was uh, actually a correct opinion, which we don't always get to say. And it's a big win for, I mean, especially given that it's in Kentucky. Is it, uh, w can you tell us which court it was in and whether there's any indication of an appeal? I mean, this was just decided today. Mm -hmm. um, it's in the Eastern District of Kentucky, the U.S. District Court there. Um, so I, there hasn't been any indication the state would appeal. I think the, the decision um, is kind of lighthearted. I think the judge took to task you know, the, the subject matter we're dealing with and kind of picked, he used some of the same examples we used in our brief to say, hey, the state's really not saying these things. So I, I think the state, um, particularly if there is a new transportation cabinet yeah. uh, managing this may say, um, let's, like, let's, let's resolve this in the proper constitutional way rather than appealing. If there's an appeal, that would go to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals um, to, decide, to decide the issue. There have been other cases like this in other states and Almost all of them have gone the way that the way that we're arguing. Unfortunately, um, the state of Indiana's Supreme Court had ruled the other way, and so this judge here basically said, "I find that decision to be unconvincing, and I'm going to go with these other opinions." Nice. So there's a dispute to some extent in this country about what to what extent people can choose their their plates, but um, that decision is an outlier, and the other cases I think are in more firm ground. Pretty uniform. Well, we're going to, I think we're going to move on and talk about the uh, other big news uh, from today. Yeah, so um, 
Espinosa. Yeah, that we're filing. We're, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're filing, filing a brief. Filing with the Supreme so, Court. So <laughs> yes, while we're all up here in the studio, um, we're just gonna stick with our, um, our like legal. technical wonky uh, legal news. Um, that was a huge win today out of um, district court in Kentucky that we didn't necessarily know what happened this morning, um, but we are also filing a friend of the court an amicus brief in a really big U.S. Supreme Court case, um, the Espinosa case, which is. Um, considering uh, government money going to private religious schools. Uh, why don't you, Andrew and Patrick worked on this brief together. Andrew, why don't you give us a little background on what the case is about um, and what our brief was about? Sure, so this is Espinoza versus the Montana Department of Revenue. And it's a little bit of a weird case, so I'm gonna let Patrick jump in whenever he wants to. But essentially, uh, there was this neo-voucher program that Montana set up that would, allow through a convoluted process money to flow to Christian schools, taxpayer money to flow to Christian schools. And the Montana Supreme Court struck that down under the state constitution's no aid clause. So this is, these no aid clauses are in many state constitutions, almost all of them around the country, but um, they're a little bit more explicit than the US constitution. So they say, typically something like no aid will flow indirectly or directly to religious organizations, churches, or religious schools. So it's more explicit than the US Constitution. And under that provision, the Montana Supreme Court struck down the entire neo-voucher program, not just as it applied to religious schools, but the whole program altogether. So there is no longer any voucher system whatsoever, either for private secular schools or for private religious schools. So that's what the Montana Supreme Court decided. And then these three parents in the case, these three Christian parents said that is discrimination against Christians. And we are taking this case to the Supreme Court. They are supported by the Institute for Justice, which is a voucher organization. They push really heavily for vouchers. We've tangled them a couple times on issues. Uh, and we are submitting a brief along with American Atheists, Center for Inquiry, uh, and American Humanist Association, right? Yeah. So, uh, and that's going in uh, today or tomorrow, I believe. Yeah, so. today. Um, so what's FFRF's perspective? What did we have to say in our brief we filed as an amicus, a friend of the court, weighing in on the side of the state of Montana, obviously, um, to support these no aid clauses um, and the power of states to um, restrict public funding to public schools? Um, what did our brief say? Well, we, we really took a, um, I guess, a basic level. It's like, how do you approach a case? What perspective are you looking at it? Mm -hmm. And here you have, you know, I uh, think a sympathetic plaintiffs, the parents of students who want to send their children to schools and are looking at it um, from their perspective of do they have a free exercise right to use state, basically state money, according to the Montana Supreme Court, to, to send their children to a religious school and get a religious education. And so what's really lost here, and I think um, Andrew did a good job of highlighting, is flipping the script, which is we need to look at the rights of every citizen of Montana. And that right is to not be compelled or coerced into supporting religion, including financially um, under, the, under the Montana Constitution, even indirect payments of money, which is kind of how this was working, would be a problem. And so um, looking at that right as, as the basic right, rather than purely looking at it from the plaintiff claims that there's a free speech violation here, now we must analyze that. Really, there's good reason that the state um, has restricted this. And I think Andrew also, just more from your historic background and research, was able to point out, um, and maybe you can talk a little about this, just kind of the historic roots of this idea that yeah. they can't be taxed to support religion. Right. I mean, yeah, so th this is, they are trying to argue that this case is about discrimination. What this case is really about is government-enforced tithing. You know, can the government use its coercive taxing power to take money from every Montana citizen and then turn around and give it to religious parents and religious schools? And the answer to that is no, they definitely can't. And the idea that, that the taxing power of the government, the coercive taxing power of the government, can't be used to take money from citizens and give it to religion, to churches, to religious schools, is at the heart of religious freedom. I mean, it is something that the founders talked about and focused on constantly in all of the earliest nuggets of religious freedom that we see from the founding on. This, it is the, the progenitor, the, the central thesis of religious liberty is that you cannot be taxed and then the government take that tax money and give it to a church. Right, so what we've seen from 
our ultra conservative uh, Supreme Court and who has decided to take this case that was already decided in the way that uh, we would support, which is not a good sign, not a great sign. Um, what we've seen in other cases and that's being being pushed and furthered by lawsuits like these and the groups behind them is this sort of perversion of what the idea of religious liberty is vis-a-vis -vis government, which is that if government dollars go to secular public schools, then it violates my free exercise rights not to get some of those dollars too. Um, and it's this um, f appeal to fairness um, and it's somewhat compelling and conf because it's confusing the issue, I think, for in the minds of a lot of people. And obviously, um, it's been latched onto by this court um, and and other lower federal federal courts. So, what do we think? Um, what do we think is there is to be done about um, a a bad decision in Espinoza? Well, I mean, a lot of it will depend on how it comes down. And you're, you're right that they've done a great job of confusing the issue. And, and by tying their argument to a discrimination argument, it is compelling to people who don't fully understand it, which is why we, we in this brief, we really tried to, we tried to write it simply. Um, we didn't focus as much on case law. We didn't focus as much on the structure of the Neo Voucher program as a lot of the other groups did. And we also kept it really short. I mean, our brief came in at about uh, a third of the word limit. This is something that anybody can pick up and read and understand without having the legal background on this case or understanding what a no-aid clause or anything like that. You can pick it up. You can read it. You can understand why the decision in this case is very obvious and what the Supreme Court needs to do. Uh, and they need to say that, nope, the Montana Supreme Court got it right. There is no way that we can give religious parents and religious schools a right, a constitutional right to access public funds. That, that has never been the way we've understood the Constitution and we're not gonna reinterpret it now. Right. Um... So I want to take some questions. I also am realizing that we might have Dan Barker Skyping in because we just don't, we cannot accept defeat from Skype. <laughs> um, so if Dan's still on the line, he's out on the road. We'll... Okay, okay so we'll... we'll talk to Dan after questions. We've got a few here and they're kind of right on point with the um, Espinosa private school voucher topic. So I'm going to jump right in. So here we go. Um, Amanda Hines asks, do private schools that receive voucher funds have to follow civil rights laws or, and or couldn't they discriminate based on race, religion, other, um, other categories? And of course, this is a general question, but this goes to the heart of right. what's wrong with um, a lot of the public funding in these schemes. Yeah, right. So it's an issue. Um, I mean, it can be, a, uh, it depends on state law. So some states... Um, if they're receiving any any public funds, can have that requirement. And so, for instance, a companion case to this Montana one is out of Maine, and we also filed a brief in that Maine case. Actually, that was filed last week, and the state of Maine wouldn't allow that. So, if if you're contracting with the government, there's non-discrimination provisions, and so that's one problem with potential schools that would want to participate or that claim they want to participate is they actually might not even be able to get the money at all if they discriminate in their admissions or in their hiring. Um, what we've seen in some states that have implemented voucher programs is sometimes they have um, very weak uh, non-discrimination protections. So for instance, in Wisconsin, uh, which has a very long running voucher program out of Milwaukee, that they have certain protections that say um, you can't, uh, basically you couldn't discriminate on the basis of religion and admissions for that. Uh, but that would be obviously really hard to enforce because you'd have to have somebody knowing that and then how proving that they somehow weren't able to participate fully in the school or weren't admitted uh, because of they didn't want to participate in any, in any religious activities. And so our brief really brought this on, um, I guess the best way I could say it is be careful what you wish for. Yeah, because that's a good way to say if, these, if the states, if the state of Montana is going to have this program, that means religious schools are going to be regulated. And right now they're, they're largely unregulated. So today the current um, in most places, they can make decisions discriminatory on their admissions, um, on their, we, we hear about it all the time for um, Catholic schools firing employees who are in same-sex relationships. Mm -hmm. So 
they have that right to do that, but that doesn't necessarily entitle them to any public money. And so I think we think any public um, funding should have non-discrimination requirements if it goes to that. And so I think that's potentially right. a problem if the court rules in favor of the parents here is that there's going to be greater state regulation on religious schools. Right. And that also doesn't necessarily yeah. foster religious freedom if there's more regulation. Of then course. This, it's one of the things we really tried to bring home in the end. Like, If the court is going to rewrite state church relations, it is going to bring down regulation on religious schools. So right now, they're claiming that they have a religious right to access these public funds. And in, if that happens, they're actually going to have less religious liberty by virtue of all the government regulation that is going to rain down on them as a result of this. And I mean, and uh, I don't remember our questioner's name, but she is, you know, yes, a lot of these schools are completely exempt. I mean, I testified about this very issue in Colorado, and uh, there was a, a lot of parents there with kids who have disabilities who this actually ends up hurting the public schools even more because those kids with disabilities can't get served at the private voucher schools. And so they all end up stuck in one public school system and it becomes more expensive for the public schools to, to do this and helps corrupt this. And of course, this is something else we, we point out in our brief is that that's one of the goals of vouchers. You know, they, they pitch it now as school choice, but really one of the goals of vouchers has been to destroy public schools. That's, that's what they're seeking to do uh, because they see public education as uh, eroding the Protestant majority in the United States. Right. Um, and of course, while simultaneously making this free exercise argument to have equal dollars um, to, to public schools, um, we see in other cases, uh, religious organiza organizations, including um, religious schools, um, fighting to the death to maintain their exemption from right. from secular laws. And so, I mean, this is not a case where, you know, they want to accept the yoke of government regulation in all of its uh, uh, pluses and minuses. It's wanting to have all the cake and eat all the things. Yeah. Um, we, we, actually, we, we use that line in the brief. We said uh, they want to have their cake, which they think the taxpayers should buy and eat it too. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, okay, here's another question. Um, uh, on this topic from Jean and on Facebook, would this ruin uh, the SCOTUS case? Will this ruin FFRF's victory about taxpayer funded church repairs in New Jersey? Uh, I mean, no, it, it won't. And I mean, again, it depends. It, it depends on how the system, uh, how the decision comes down. But but no, I don't think it will. I mean, that that decision's finalized. Um, the programs have been rewritten. We're keeping an eye on them. There's no money that has gone to. Uh, churches that we've seen uh, since that decision well, came In fact, out. they sought Supreme Court review, yeah. and justices, uh, and I don't recall who, who wrote the opinion, but Kavanaugh. concurred, Kavanaugh concurred in not taking that case, although indicated, and maybe that was foreshadowing to obviously taking this case, is, hey, there's some issues we need to, to look at here. So they let our New Jersey Supreme Court victory stand, but indicated there might be they they maybe want to look at this issue in another case and so that's obviously what's going on with Espinoza but the landscape may change and we won't really know the full implications of um, repairing and building churches is one of the worst things you, government could be doing getting involved in and so is that going to somehow is there going to be challenges to that even though we have this great um, decision from the state of New Jersey right right okay um, here's a question um, from Liz Reynolds. If we can't count on the Supreme Court, are there other ways to protect secular public schools? I mean, <clears throat> there are a lot of ways to protect secular public schools other than the Supreme Court. And I mean, I don't, I don't think we can count on the Supreme Court anymore. But one thing that I've been encouraging people to do, and um, you know, been kind of going around the country talking on this book tour, is people need to run for office, especially local office. I mean, school boards, there's usually unopposed races. Uh, if you are watching this program, you're the kind of person that should run for office. And I know a lot of people out there think like, oh, I don't have any, I don't have any skills. What do I know about it? I mean, look at who is in public office right now. You are more than qualified compared I can to mention any, any names. Yeah, not not gonna mention any names or even at, you know talk about the levels of highest <laughs> level of government that they may have reached. Uh, you are more than capable of occupying a public office. Uh, so I would encourage everybody out there watching this and su who supports FFRF to run for school boards. Yeah, Just I will say that was the message of, um, remember when we went to protest uh, Franklin Graham? Yeah. Was it, is it Franklin Graham? Yeah. Here at the Capitol, 
Um, and there were just thousands of people there to see him bust in from all over the state. Franklin Graham, um, Billy Graham, son, son of a preacher man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and his big message to all of his evangelical supporters is go to the lowest level of, um, you know, municipal government that you can find and get yourself on those um, boards and commissions and um, low levels of government because that's where, you know, well, uh, the things are happening. I mean, we can even back up for that. I mean, that was his message, but that, that was his father's message and a, a message that's been pushed in, really through the 70s and 80s. And the reason that you, you saw this Christian nationalist wave in 2016 was because a lot of those people had worked their way up through the ranks. Uh, and so, I mean, the Christian nationalism that you're seeing running rampant through in governments around the country, I think, is directly attributable to them pushing their followers to run for public office. And mm. there's no reason uh, our, our side cannot be doing the same thing. We ought to be. Yeah. But I mean, in that vein, Pat, sorry I interrupted you if you had something to say on this. But I was just thinking, Andrew's trying to swing for the fences and hit a home run here. <laughs> I, I'd be fine yeah. with, with uh, something that anybody could do if they're not up for running for office via whatever their po posture is. But states aren't required to implement these types of programs. Right. So yeah. you can communicate with your legislators and say, I support our public schools. I don't want this kind of dual system. Um, there's really good reasons for public schools besides what our issues are, which are kind of re related to religion. Um, but one of them, and I think, I mean, I'm a, a lot of the people here have attended, who work in our office have attended both public schools and private schools. I'm one of those people. And one of the cool things about attending public schools when I left left a private Catholic school was there's people who aren't your religion there. Like, yeah. you're, you know, it's a melting pot of <coughs> our common school system is Just not religiously going. segregated. That's a, that's a good thing <laughs> in this country that our students are going to school with people that aren't exactly like them and that's something you can just communicate to legislators. Basically, that's a, a, a lesser degree right. of what Andrew's and saying. And it's in that same vein, which is these decisions are being made at the state and local level as to whether or not these programs exist in the first place, right? right? right One thing right. the Supreme Court yeah. is not going to rule yet uh, is that states are required to, you know, operate these systems right. where public funding is going to private schools at all. I mean, any state is within their right to, or, you know, this school district is within their right to only operate public schools with their public dollars. And that's what you want your elected officials to be focused on. And, um, you know, they're following, they're following public opinion on that. Well, and, just, and one more, one more point, if people want to do that, which I think is a great idea, FFRF's website has a ton of resources on vouchers. I mean, and and it helps you rebut all the common arguments about vouchers. First of all, we know they don't work. Vouchers do not improve student performance. They don't rescue students from failing public schools. Most of the voucher money that we know of goes to kids who are already in private schools. So it's paying kids whose families can already afford private schooling right. to go to private school with public money. It's like 80% usually is the number. And of course, Wisconsin is a case study in, yeah. in the failure of, um, of private voucher. It's just, I mean, there's also people have studied the Louisiana voucher system, yeah. some of the Indiana system. There's, there's been, it's been studied. And believe me, if it, if it was this panacea of a fix, the other side, which is, which was paying for a lot of the um, studies would be would be promoting that and telling yeah. us and there's, <laughs> it's really not it's really not improving education outcomes so let's let's work on our public school yeah, system and, and Pat's done a ton of work put together a ton of resources for FFRF and they're on our website I would encourage people to go find them we just we know that this is a way to destroy public schools and to get public money to private Christian organizations that that is the only goal of vouchers it's not to help students it's not about school choice right um, okay I oops I will not read the troll question, but I will <laughs> read this comment praising us. Uh, Michael Romano, thank you for your praise. This is a great format, live interview, nice set, interesting interview <laughs> subjects. Patrick, that's you. Solid moderator, love her socks. That's an inside joke. Um, he didn't say that. Well done. Looking forward to more of these. And again, you can see us uh, live on Facebook pretty much every Wednesday at the same time, uh, noon. So um, now we are going to go to Dan Barker, who is patiently waiting on Skype. And Dan's he... supposed, he's supposed to be at a retreat writing. Oh, there he is. Yeah, he's at a writer's retreat. There he is. Look how relaxed you look <laughs> and creative. Hi. Hi, can Dan. You hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Oh, good. So I've been watching the show. Good show. Congratulations, you guys, Patrick, Thank you. Andrew, Liz, and everybody. 
Did you hear about the heart case? The good news. Yeah, we're sharing the good news. So so keep fighting the fight. I'm here on a two-week vacation, using vacation time uh, to write. Two weeks to do nothing but sit here in the coast of California and uh, looking at the waves and the bay and the birds and uh, the mountains and all of that. It's rough and then being spending time on my laptop, reading books and writing. It's just a, it's a dream. So well, that's, you... that's cool. It's 17 degrees here. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think it's getting down to the low 70s here today. So Okay, so. bundle up. I understand Annie Laurie has been shoveling a little bit while I'm gone. <laughs> so are you writing? What are you writing about? So, yes, I am writing. And by the way, I'm trying to get a beard like Patrick's, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's not coming in black. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. So I think I'll, sh- I'll uh, he, he likes shave your it off. beard better than mine. I oh, don't so, know to um, talk about this. So I'm working on a project called The End of Worship. And you know how Sam Harris wrote a book, um, The End of Faith? Why do we believe? Well, I'm writing a book about why do we worship and what's wrong with worship. And this writer's retreat is called the Mesa Refuge. I'm here on a generous fellowship from an FFRF member named Richard Kirschman, who just died about a year ago. He's the guy who um, gave us the idea of the A Merit Badge. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Uh Uh-huh. For the Boy Scouts. Um, You know, like Boy Scouts and that. And he is a very highly respected person here. It's in Point Reyes Station. And he just died, and it's, it's very sad. He had so many great ideas. But anyway, he um, he provided this fellowship for two weeks for me to just sit here and read and relax and write. There's a beautiful deck down by the water where you can just put your feet up and just watch all the wildlife and work. So, um, all right, I think we're cutting out here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. We, we're very oh, jealous. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we're just we're just jealous because it's freezing here. There was a polar vortex yesterday. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, was there? Yeah, it was terrible. So do you want me to do something about it? You know, maybe I'm God. Maybe I could uh, <laughs> just change the weather for you. Work your magic. Look, yeah. thanks for tuning in, but stop procrastinating and uh, uh, go do some writing. <laughs> so we'll see you guys on Monday. Thanks for all you're doing. All right. Bye, thanks, Dan. Dan. Bye. Have fun. <sighs> Jerk. <laughs> um uh, yeah, Dan has actually written many really interesting books. I think he's uh, up to like 10. I think he's up to 10 yeah, books Yeah, this now. might be like his 10th book that he's working on. His children's books, are, which are really good if yeah. people don't know about them. They should pick those up. For um, yeah. They make a great uh, Christmas and or solstice and or Festivus present. <laughs> yeah, all his books are great and available in our store. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, making sure we have no more questions and then we will... Say goodbye. Yep. Okay. We're done here. No questions for Dan. (laughs) Which is good because he's gone anyway. (laughs) Oh, good. Well, listen, that's our show for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Sorry about the uh, change in plans, but tune in next week, Wednesday at noon central for another edition of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank Thank you. you. Goodbye.